If the TV ads are correct, and I'm never sure whether we should believe them or not, people everywhere seem to be looking for their origins. Ancestry.com is doing a very brisk business, and DNA is being shipped around the world so that people might find out who or what they are. And of course, we've all heard of the man who was practicing wearing his lederhosen, only to discover that he was Scots and he needed a tartan. <laughs> but what I think is interesting is not so much that they are discovering the main line from which they come, but it's those tiny percentages that are being sent back to them, that they're 3% this and 4% that, which is a perfectly wonderful way of saying a very blunt truth, and that is, we are all mongrels. <laughs> now, having digested that little fact, I am certain there are some among you looking very confused as to why I chose that text for the Feast of the Ascension. It says nothing about Jesus going anywhere, does it? But I chose it for a reason. As some of you know, it is one of my favorite texts from the Gospels, but that was not why I chose it for this day. This day, something new begins for those first disciples of Jesus. Up until this moment, in the joy and the confusion of the Easter season, Jesus has been coming back to them. He pops up at odd little moments. He joins two of them on a stroll down the road. He's on the shore grilling bread and fish for breakfast. He comes to a door and joins them for a meal. He's not quite finished with them. But the ascension is very final. He physically leaves this earth. And when they go back to their gathering place in Jerusalem this day, they have a very big question mark in their minds. What do we do now? Where do we go? He left us no written text. And as I know, those of you who have been in my classes know, there was no scripture written as yet. They had nothing to go by but their memory. And so they sat down, certainly, to figure out what his legacy to them was and what they should do with it. And each of them, I'm sure, remembered something different, the way we all are when we get our memory gems working. But I hope one of them remembered this, because I believe this is a text which is so characteristic of Christianity that if we lost the rest of it, everything Jesus wanted us to know is embedded there. This is his legacy. Just picture that afternoon when it happened. He was most probably in Capernaum, in the doorway of a house. Houses were very small, so he, they allowed him to shelter in the doorway, and the courtyard was crowded. Oh, there were housewives and some small children, a farmer or two, a tax collector. I wouldn't be at all surprised if there wasn't a Roman official of some kind under the pretext of making certain that all was in good order, listening perhaps with his heart as well as his ears. And then somebody near the gate utters the cry, your family's out in the street. In that first century world, one of two things should have happened. Jesus should either have said, excuse me, and made his way through the crowd to them, or he should have said, make room, let them come in. And he does neither. He looks around at this motley group in front of him, and he says, well, who is my family? Who are my mother and my brothers and sisters? He was not denying that woman out in the street who had given him life. He knew her only too well, and she knew him only too well. Nor was he denying blood kinship with the men and the women there. 
but he was recreating what he had come to give us in his message. He was recreating community. He was saying, from this moment on, anyone trying to do the will of my Father in heaven is family. And that one of you looks stunned. But had you lived in the first century world, you would have been shocked. Your blood family was your everything. It was your insurance policy. It was your old age home. It was your employment agency. It was the marriage bureau. It was everything. And suddenly that everything is done away with. And he's giving us a legacy far greater. He is saying we all belong to each other. Look around. There are people in front of you, in back of you, beside you, who don't look like you. And yet, you are family because Jesus has said so. These disciples are going to be challenged very shortly by a knock on the door from the Gentile world saying, may we join you Jewish Christians? And it's going to upend their way of thinking. Peter is finally going to confess that I truly understand, he says, that God shows no partiality and if God gave to them, the Romans, the same gift that he's giving us, who was I that I could hinder God? That's the legacy. In the period between the Ascension and Pentecost, that little Christian group is attempting to find out what their legacy is, and once they know what it is, they'll know what to do with it. This might be an apt moment to think of the story of Aunt Matilda. I don't quite know where I first heard it, and I might be stealing it from Dr. Brown. <laughs> so if so, I beg apologies right now. But it's a wonderful story that's stuck in my head of a very wealthy woman who had but one beloved nephew who was marrying, and he fully expected a wedding gift from Aunt Matilda that would end all wedding gifts. So when the package arrived from her, he was thrilled. She was elderly and could not come to the wedding, but she sent the gift with her love. And he opened it excitedly, because she has lots of money. And what had she sent him? A Bible. And he and his bride-to-be looked at the box, looked like a nice leather cover, and he put the lid back on it and it was gradually to find its way into the attic. And many years later, when the disappointed young nephew was no longer young and had died, and his wife had died, and the family was cleaning out the attic, somebody found the box covered with dust, dusted it off and opened it up. And Aunt Matilda had written on the flyleaf, I'm giving you my favorite Bible passages, and so that you don't miss them, I have marked them. And every one was marked with a $100 bill. <laughs> he had missed Aunt Matilda's legacy both ways. He had missed her soul's journey in the marked scripture passages, and he had even missed the monetary gift that she was offering him. Why? Because he never bothered to investigate further. Now, most of us don't have an Aunt Matilda, but we do have the Christian legacy. We do have this need to share what is most deeply rooted in every one of us by virtue of our baptism and our call to the Christian community. You might want to think if somebody said, well, what do you believe and what's important to you? What would you come up with? It might be hard work. But this is what the disciples are about. This is, the, to me, the ascension message. It isn't what Jesus is doing when he leaves us. 
It's what should be happening within us now that he is inviting us to move into the next phase of our journey. Our legacy, we all have one to offer of memories and hopes and dreams, but have we also a faith one to share? We who are one family. There's a little book that I hope many of you have read and it forced me to think about things in a different way. The book is badly titled, I think. It's called The News of the World by Paulette Giles. I've read it three times, and I haven't got it all figured out yet. But it's this, roughly, it's the story of a veteran of all the wars of the 19th century, ending with the Civil War. And he's now in Texas, in a part of the country that is mm, a bit, shall we say, untamed at the moment. And he earns his living by going from city to city, renting a space, and reading the news of the world in little excerpts to people who can't read some of them, who don't have access to newspapers. And so this is how he earns his living. And his life is upended when he is, for a sum of money, given a little girl, 10 years old, to return to her family. In, outside San Antonio, and he's up in the north of Texas. Her family was massacred by the Kiowa Indians, who for some reason did not kill her. They killed her parents, they killed her little sister. But they took her captive, and for five years she has been one of them. And she has totally forgotten her heritage as a German-American white child. She does not know her original name, which is Johanna. She only knows her Kiowa name, which is Cicada. She's forgotten all of her English. She's forgotten every aspect of civilized living. She doesn't have a clue what you do with a fork. And so Captain Kidd and this half-savage little girl make their way through Texas. And he has two responsibilities. He has to return her to her aunt and uncle. And he also has to protect her on the way. Or there are soldiers who would love to have her for a nefarious purpose. Their enemies would love to kill the two of them. And on the way, he teaches her what of her legacy of living as a white child that he thinks she needs. She has so forgotten English that she can no longer pronounce an R. Her name, little by little, she realizes is Johanna. It's a fascinating little book. And every time I read it, I rethink of what would I do in a circumstance like that. He wants her to understand what her legacy is as she comes back into the white world. Jesus wanted us to understand what our legacy is as we move ever deeper into our Christian commitment. So when the apostles gathered in that upper room, male and female, share their Jesus memories over these days, they're really putting together the core of our faith. What do we believe and why do we believe it and how do we believe it? And they're trying to remember the Jesus pieces that they can then share with a pagan world that has never heard of anything like this love. We have something great to share, we Christians. We don't do it enough, we don't do it well enough, but let's not berate ourselves. Let's start anew. Those of you always looking for homework, here is your homework with a final exam for heaven's date, I think, all right? But what are we passing on? What do we exude as members of a family of a crucified, risen, and ever-living Jesus from Nazareth? What do we as Christians have to offer a world that somehow right now seems desperate for our message. We do not all have to speak of God in the same terms, 
But whether we are speaking of God or Yahweh or Allah, are we not all speaking of the same being in whose name we are family? And we don't even see the word family in the same way. And we don't have to. It matters not what our orientations are sexually. What matters is, where is your heart oriented? Do we ask that question of each other? I think we as Christians have both a great responsibility and a lot of work to do that we have to get on with. I plan to do that starting from today. How about you? What can we bring that a hungry world who every day finds a new kind of division, what can we do to give that world something that'll dissolve some of those divisions and help us see ourselves as Jesus saw us when he looked at that courtyard in the Galilee and said, here's my family. It is on them that I can rely. If I could end on a personal note, I want to thank you, each and every one of you. We have written a page, whether you know it or not, in interdenominational living and praying. I come from one denomination, most of you are from a different one. And the amazing thing is, over these 37 years, we've gotten along so nicely. <laughs> People always ask, you know, well, what are your doctrinal differences? What have you quarreled about? And the answer is we haven't. Because we were wise enough, both you and I, not to think about doctrinal differences, not to look at our different ways of worshiping, but to find the one thing that could bind us together, which is the word of God. And that's what we've spent our 37 years looking at, have we not? And look what we've done. I know of no other Protestant church that would have put up with a Catholic nun for 37 years. <laughs> I do not know what the Dutch burghers in 1628 upstairs in their grist mill would have thought of this particular little <laughs> endeavor that we've had. I'm not even sure what Dr. Peel thinks of what became of our great experiment, he and I. But I know just one thing. We have done something quite unique. And I know as an English teacher, you can't qualify unique, but I'm going to qualify it anyway. <laughs> and so I would like to end with the prayer that Paul used when he wrote to his church in Philippi, his favorite church, the church that never broke his heart, his first European church, and by the way, the church that he founded with a woman, Lydia, as its leader. Maybe that has something to do with it. It was the church that answered his every call for help. And I would like to make his words mine in conclusion. Paul wrote, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best so that you might produce a harvest of righteousness. And we'll find out at Heaven's Gate whether you've done your homework or not. <laughs> Bless you.